Aloha, I'm Derek Sebastian, and welcome to the Knee Save Veterans Memorial Center's annual dinner. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope you all enjoy. Aloha and mahalo. Since 1990, Stanford Car Development has succeeded as an award-winning development firm completing over 5,000 units. Our mission to develop quality residential communities that island families call home, providing increased affordable housing opportunities utilizing the latest technology and materials, design distinctive neighborhoods with a broad range of housing for our island communities to live, work, and play with a passion for architecture and community design. Stanford Car Development. We know Hawaii and we build for Hawaii. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center annual dinner event. Let's give a big round of applause for Derek Sebastian. You can find more of Derek's videos and music on his website at DerekSebastian.com. My name is Bo Mahoy, and I'm happy to be co emceeing this evening with Deidre Teagarden. We want to let you 
know that we are following all COVID-19 rules and regulations. We sure are. Thank you, Bo. And thank you all for joining us this evening. You know, there are so many hands that came together to make tonight possible, including all of you who really went with the flow, ordered your dinners and picked them up and are now enjoying them um, at home. And you can see a little video here um, on our wonderful bento pickup. We want to mahalo our wonderful event team, event co-chairs Beryl Ball, Catherine Yee, and Diane Orikasa, silent auction co-chairs Rachel Oye and Lois Bryan, Hawaii Gamma Alpha Delta Kappa Chapter, Todd Perkins of Hawaii Video Memories, Maui sons and daughters of the Nisei veterans. Food provided by the chefs at TJ's Warehouse and Umi Sushi. And how about those amazing swag bags designed by Liana Young, filled with tasty treats from TJ's and Ito Family Farms. And depending on the level of dinner package that you got, artwork from Mallory Arazumi and DVDs from Lane Nishikawa. We just wanna thank also um, all of the hardworking juniors from Baldwin High School, led by Zia Ota. And of course, there we have our external director giving some popcorn, courtesy of service rentals, uh, to some of our wonderful supporters. Isn't it great to see all the action, Bo? How about that volunteer palette of ours? It's quite diverse. They share their knowledge, skills, abilities, and in all different age groups. Mahalo to all. And you know what, it's really exciting tonight too. I know you're going to talk about this a little bit later on, but we have some of our veterans watching tonight as well. And people just saw on the video, Mr. Masao Motooka from the, he had served in the military intelligence service uh, with Karen Motooka. They're driving away with their bentos. And we can't say enough about the Maui sons and daughters of the Nisei veterans for all that they did uh, to help with the, the parking and the drive through. And how about all of the ladies up there making sure everybody got their bentos put in the swag bags. It's really quite amazing. Your virtual presence and support mean a great deal to us and demonstrate the importance of our mission, which is to ignite human potential by inspiring people to find the hero in themselves through the legacy of the Nisei veterans. One of the jobs of the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center is to perpetuate and honor the legacy of our Nisei veterans, for without them, we would not be here. I wanna take a moment to recognize those veterans on the call with us this evening. Masao Motooka, Harold Okumura, both served in the military intelligence service. We also want to acknowledge the Korean War Veterans Association of Maui, our Vietnam veterans, and all those who have served and continue to serve. And before we call up um, anybody else, we wanna just let people know, again, a big mahalo to everybody who drove through. We have some Maui sons and daughters there helping with the parking. I see Floyd Nagoshi giving a big high five. Uh, so again, Thank you so much to all of you who really made tonight very special for all of us. And I wanted to let everybody know this beautiful Tsudu peace crane background that you see me standing in front of. Um, if you've been following all of the activity happening here at the center and the enclosure of the Stanley Izumigawa Pavilion, which is now going to be the Stanley Izumigawa Resource Center, you will know that we are collecting 1,001 peace cranes. Uh, Melanie Agrabanti, our research archivist is creating a lovely art piece and all of these sudo will be uh, up in our resource center so we're hoping if you haven't already signed a crane come on down to the center and sign one of the ones we have or you can make your own by using a six by six piece of paper it can be origami paper or any paper that you want sign it and it will be part of our beautiful display um, that's behind me and then up at the resource center. 
And getting back to everything that's happening tonight, we will be asking everybody three trivia questions throughout the evening. So we want you to answer those trivia questions in that little question and answer box at the bottom left of your screen. And the person to answer it correctly first will receive a wonderful swag bag full of fantastic Nisei veterans goodies. So we hope you stay tuned um, for that. And Bo, I send it back over to you to introduce our next speaker. At this time, I would like to call upon Nisei Veteran Memorial Center Board Chair, Kyoko Kimura. For those checking in from Japan, konnichiwa. I may not look like it, but I speak Japanese too. Not as good as DJ. Just like all the other organizations, we were affected by this pandemic. But compared to what the Nisei veterans went through, this difficulty was nothing for us. So we didn't stop at all. Besides the groundbreaking of the Stanley Izumikawa, Resource Center, we had so much um, virtual sessions. Thank goodness for the Zoom. We had speakers from all over the world or children from Kikyo Preschool in Hakodate, Hokkaido in Japan performed the wonderful hula and the soranbushi for us. Um, everybody at the Adult Daycare Center and the uh, children at our Kansha preschool really enjoy virtually. Under the very careful health control, we had several in-person workshops too, and all of them were sold out right away. We have very small but outstanding staff. The DJ T Garden as executive director, Melania Gravante as research archivist, and Jill Tokuda as um, advisory director. Those people just keep us move forward. But what didn't stop at all during this pandemic was the support to us. Uh, thank you, Mayor and the council members for, from the County of Maui, the governor and the legislators from the state of Hawaii and even from Japanese government. But most of all, the tremendous support, including sons and daughters from the community was what's keeping us going. So I sincerely, sincerely thank you. And I hope you enjoyed this evening. Uh -huh. Thank you, Kyoko. We have a wonderful board chair in Kyoko Kimura and we're so glad that she is part of our family and has been so active making sure that we have support and interest from Japan. So thank you, Kyoko. And speaking of big supporters, the mayor and his wife have been avid supporters of the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center from before its inception. And in fact, Joyce Lynn Nakahashi was the 1975 Chrysanthemum Queen with a young Mike Victorino as her escort. So it is only fitting that we have Mayor Victorino here with us this evening to share some welcome remarks he is a dear friend of the center, and we're so glad he took some time from his schedule today to be with us, Mayor. Good evening, everyone, and congratulations on your annual fundraiser. My wife and I, Joyce Lynn, are so honored to be here this evening because we have participated in many and numerous uh, virtual uh, gatherings, but this is the first one that we have Kaiseki Bento Dinners from TJ's Warehouse. Talk about first class all the way. I want to thank and congratulate you, Deja T. Garden, for your great work, your dedicated board members, and of course, your wonderful and dedicated president, Kyoko Kimura, for the outstanding program tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Our keynote speaker is Lei Nishikawa, who follows the tradition of the Nisei veterans by leading by example. His contributions to the arts and theater 
films have matched only his commitment to the community here in Hawaii and his new community in San Diego and far beyond. Most, mostly, I'm curious to know about who will win the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center's Hero Award. After 20 years, there are many, many people in Maui County who deserved being called a hero. So you know, whoever wins tonight will, we, will represent many uh, uh, others like Mike, like-minded, I should say, excuse me, warm-hearted people who serve this community with no expectation of reward. I love your mission statement, inspiring people to find the hero in themselves through the legacy of the Nisei veterans. It has been very tough times. And lately, we need to kind and find heroes. I love this because we need more heroes each and every day. The great songwriter Bob Dylan once wrote, a hero is someone who understands responsibility that comes with freedom. Lately, it seems more and more people are demanding the rights while ignoring their responsibilities. However, our Nisei veterans are in particular the legendary 442 Regimental Conduct Team lived and died those responsibilities that came with freedom. Today, we look forward to the Nisei veterans as role models for doing what the right thing always, not only when it was hard, but when it was especially hard. This is the gift the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center brings to Maui, to Hawaii, and far beyond the Pacific. Today, we need heroes more than ever, so thank you for bringing heroes to our world. On behalf of myself and my lovely wife, Joyce Lynn, and I wanted to make a special note. Back of me here on this wall is her father, Chester Nakahashi, who, was in the, who served in the MIS, and we're very proud of what he did through the years. So we wanna say mahalo to all of you. Have a great evening. Look forward to seeing what Lane has to say about his story. God bless you all. Aloha, ahoi ho. Thank you so much, Mayor and Mrs. Victorino. Um, we are so appreciative of all the support that you give to us all the time, both um, just from yourself and as well as from, from the county as well. So Bo, I, I turn it back over to you. Tonight would not be possible without the support of our corporate sponsors. Please help me thank our presenting sponsor, Stanford Car Development. And our inspiration level sponsors, Abbey Carpet of Maui, Dowling Company, Housemart, Maui Toyota, Pesha Hawaii, Napa United Auto Parts, VIP Food Service. We cannot forget our Remembrance Level Sponsors, Arizumi Brothers Incorporated, ABC Stores, Hale Mahaolu, Maui Sons and Daughters of the Nisei Veterans, Sai Designs, Service Rentals, The Maui News, and TJ's Warehouse. We will take a short break to hear from two of tonight's sponsors. When we come back, we will ask our first trivia question of the evening. Peisha Hawaii is a third generation family owned company whose ties to the islands date back to World War II. We offer the broadest scope of ocean transportation services between Hawaii and the mainland. And we take pride in supporting our local businesses and communities where we live and work. For our Pesha Hawaii Ohana, serving Hawaii is our business. Imagine shopping for a new car in a friendly environment. A showroom sparkling with quality and reliability. Filled with sleek, shiny, irresistible, and affordable must-have vehicles. Yet no high-pressure salespeople. Only courteous customer assistance with aloha spirit. This is the reality of Maui Toyota. Come discover the difference. Test drive the new Toyotas at Maui Toyota. 320 Hana Highway, Kahului. Welcome back. 
Are you ready for some trivia? Fingers on your keyboard. Our first question is, there are three organizations that share the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center campus, each dedicated to addressing various needs of our greater community. One of these is the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center Education Center. What are the names of the other two organizations? So anybody who knows the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center will know what the other two organizations are on our campus. And we will be watching your questions and answers to see um, who gets it right. So you feel free to type it in. Oh, there you go. There's one, Kathy Collins got the first, <laughs> the first one right. Of course, you know Kathy Wood. She's a dear friend of the center. Uh, so Kathy, there's one more organization on here as well, and I know that you know it exactly, Maui Adult Daycare Center. So the answer was Concha Preschool and Maui Adult Daycare Center. So Kathy Collins, you are our big winner of the first trivia question. A fabulous swag bag is yours. Um, so we are so excited. You know, we've, we've had so many things happening this year. It's been full of exhibits, uh, webinars, but the biggest project has undoubtedly been the enclosure of the Stanley Izumigawa um, Pavilion to be the Stanley Izumigawa Resource Center. Um, here to tell us a little bit more about the journey of the Pavilion to Resource Center is Nisei Veterans Memorial Center External Director, Jill Tokuda. And as uh, Jill makes her way to the podium, just wanted to share that a lot of people might not know that this Oahu girl actually has some very strong Maui ties. Her grandfather was actually one of the swimmers in uh, Coach Sakamoto's The Three Year Swim Club and uh, later served as a Nisei veteran in the military intelligence service. Um, Jill has been instrumental in helping us with this dream and we are so glad that she is on our team. So please help me welcome Jill Tokuda. Jill? Thank you, Deidre. Hi, Sai. Minasan konbanwa. Good evening, everyone. You know, back in 2019, I found myself wanting to give back, to thank those who had laid the path for me, who opened doors, and who lifted me up throughout my life. And when I first came to visit Nisei Veterans Memorial Center years ago, there was a familiarity uh, in this place that really felt like home. The pictures on the wall, the clothes and the letters and the displays, they weren't my relatives, but their story was our story. And that's really the special thing to me about Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, regardless of our background, where we come from, um, what we do in life, we are able to find connection and common purpose through the stories and through the values of our Nisei veterans and all those who have fought for our freedoms. You know, my grandpa's childhood on Maui, as Deidre mentioned, his service in the MIS, my great, father, great grandfather's internment in Santa Fe, joining Nisei Veterans Memorial Center on their journey for me really was a homecoming of sorts. A home is where you feel safe. A home is a place where you belong. It's built on a foundation of family, hopes, and dreams, and a shared responsibility that we have to each other. The Stanley Izumigawa Resource Center is all about us building a bigger home for Nisei Veterans Memorial Center. As more and more people come here to join our family from across Maui, Hawaii, and the world, we needed to make sure that there was a safe place for them to gather, a place to find common ground and connection, and a place where people can find inspiration and hope in those who came before. Now embarking on a capital campaign is never ever easy and raising money and starting construction during a pandemic, unprecedented. Some would even say crazy, but that's the amazing thing about family. They're there when you need them. Thanks to our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, Ohana, we are on track to complete the resource center by the end of the year. Minus a few pieces that might be stuck in the supply chain, Nisei Veterans Memorial Center will start the new year with more than double the square footage it previously had. 
greatly increasing our ability to take in archived collections, hold community gatherings and events, and host visiting scholars and students from across Hawaii and the world. Thanks to your generous support, every dollar you have given has gone a long way to completing the Resource Center. Our extended ohana, all of you listening in today, have made this building possible through your significant support. We have also had ohana in the Hawaii State Legislature, the County of Maui, the Freeman Foundation, Island Insurance Foundation, the Roy and Lorraine Okamura Trust, Atherton Foundation, Abbey Carpet and Floor, Maui Sons and Daughters of Nisei Veterans, ABC Stores, Arizumi Brothers, TJ Warehouse, Servco Foundation, Munikio Haraga, Service Rentals, and many, many more. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making this dream possible for all of us. Our home wouldn't be complete without all of you. As you watch it quickly come together over the next few months, please know that every brick and board was laid thanks to all of you. Mahalo again for your support and contributions, and we look forward to welcoming you home in 2022. Mahalo. It certainly has been a busy year, and it's not over yet. Here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, we want to ensure that we engage the next generation so that they can learn about and reflect on those Nisei men and their families who sacrifice so much. One way we do that is through our archives. The Nisei Veterans Memorial Center has over 1,000 Nisei soldier files, 200 special collections, and over 100 oral histories. These items are available to the public for research and reflection and are often showcased in our exhibits. Tonight, Maui sons and daughters of the Nisei veterans will make a special presentation. And for that, I would like to welcome sons and daughters president, Leonard Oka. It was in the early to mid nineties that the Maui sons and daughters of the Nisei veterans completed cassette oral history recordings on our Nisei veterans. Unfortunately, it has taken over 25 years to complete. Our apologies to the veterans who have all passed away since the original recordings. But we welcome the remaining families who will be receiving a bound copy of the veterans interviews. I will be calling forward a representative of each veterans family to come forward to accept their bound copy. May I first call on David and Susan Hokama to accept their family's transcript of Masatoshi Hokama. Masatoshi was a 442nd veteran and uh, in Company F. As I present these uh, transcripts, um, I'm going to read a few excerpts from, their, uh, from the transcripts itself, just to give you a, a feel of the veterans themselves. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, Masa was working in the family store. It was intended that he, be, being the only son, would one day take over the business. He did not volunteer for service, but eventually, like many other Nisi boys, was drafted into service. Mm -hmm. He states, yeah, and, when the, and then the first thing they all tell me, Masa, you lucky you didn't volunteer. Why? I thought you folks had good fun over there. Oh, hell no. We catch hell because not the, but a lot of them died. They say, you lucky you didn't volunteer. I said, I wanted to volunteer, but I'm a mama's boy. So I, got, I couldn't volunteer. Don Dancing asks, so was your mom upset when you had to, when you were uh, drafted? Masa says, of course, she cried. She thought I was going to die out there. Like our neighbors, they had four, five, mm -hmm. six boys that died. Oh, one after another killed in action, oh, nothing but funerals. Mm -hmm. And I have to go to the parents' house and they all were my classmates. So I'd like to call on Kyle Watanabe to present the, the bound transcript to the Hokamas.
Next, I'd like to call on uh, Phyllis Yamamoto Takahashi to accept her dad, Masami Yamato's transcript. He was in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team in Service Company. Phyllis? Let me read an uh, excerpt from Masami's. Uh, this is his first experience with war. He said, yeah, when we got to, uh, to Anzio, there was nothing left of the place. It was all bombed out. It's a total wreck. I remember we, I was leaving the convoy out, in the, uh, out of the bivouac area, and we finally reached camp. Bivouac all up onto the hill away from the waterfront. And that night I was given guard duty. So I was standing guard about one o'clock in the morning. I see the sky start lighting up with tracer lights. So we were under attack by the German armies. They were bom dropping bombs on the storage dump. So we see the explosions of the bomb as they fell and hit the ammo dump. And the tracers light the sky. He laughed. It was beautiful. Even with the sight of deadly fire, this new experience brings amazement to a young soldier's eyes. Except uh, number two, Masami had two brothers in the 100th Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Later on, I met my older brother, Shigeru. He had come through the replacement depot. He was going to go sent home already. The war had ended. That's the only time I saw him. So I was one of the first from the replacement depot to be sent home. The one in the 100, Chiro, came home first, and my older brother, he K Company, he came back. The older brother was Shigeru. He was K Company rifleman. My brother, Shiro, was in a medics. He was wounded twice. My older brother was wounded once. And Masami, I lost my hearing. <laughs> so that was a couple of stories that um, Masami shared. Many of the Nisei soldiers had multiple brothers serving in the 100th Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, Military Intelligence Service, and the 1399 Engineering Battalion. Luckily, all of the Yamato boys made it home safely. Here tonight to receive the bound copy of Masami Yamato's oral history transcript is his daughter, Phyllis Takahashi of Kahului. Next person is uh, Terry Imamura to accept the transcript of Charles Yukio Yukichi Arakaki on behalf of a very good friend, Arlette Arakaki Kiriyama of Utah, who is not able to be with us tonight. Charlie Arakaki was a veteran of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, Company E. Let me read some excerpt from Charlie's transcript. This is about the Hanabata days when Charlie was 10 or 11. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. And then, and then there was this one incident where, my, where we had several donkeys in the village with other people. And then I used to also help them with going, look for food for the goats and all, the, all that. One time I rode the donkey and when I was young, I couldn't tighten the belt tight. So as we were galloping, the saddle turned over and then the donkey got scared and dragged me all, all about a quarter mile on the road. Bucking and kicking. Good thing I wasn't hurt. And then all of a sudden, the saddle, saddle fell down, and then I got saved. These interviews take you from the good, fun Hanabata days to the pain and sadness of battle. Charlie remembers the sadness of battle. I went to, to help one of, my, of the sergeants from Rifle Platoon to go up to the enemy by the river to call artillery fire. They knew we were on the, in the dugout the enemy, and then they fired one, two, three. I think the third or fourth of them went right into the dugout. And then when they blasted what passed, passed him, I got. But before that, I was on that side, on his right side. Then I moved to the side, the other side, because he wanted a better view of where the, 
he was going to where he was going to fire. And then the motor came and got got him and me. Then we took him to the station, first aid station, and then he didn't make it after that. He died, and I got wounded. Like other interviews, Charlie's stories brought laughter and tears. Here to receive the, the transcript is uh, Terry Imamura, a very good friend of Arlette Arakaki, the daughter, Charlie's daughter, who's living in Utah. We'd like to thank, thank Terry for filling in for the Arakami family tonight. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to call on Caroline Endo Oishi and her son Craig Oishi, as well as Evelyn Endo Oyoka, sisters of Toshio Nancy Endo, 442nd uh, Vet Company F. Excuse my eyes, can't read my own script. Okay, okay they're slowly coming forward. I would like to read the first excerpt. Toshio Endo speaks about, a brother, about four brothers in the military service during World War II. See, like our family, our father gave four sons to the army. The first one was drafted before, the first drafting to draft during the 40s, before Pearl Harbor. That one was Aichi. Yeah, National Guard, first draft, and he stationed Kauai right around the break of war. That's the one after, before 44, 42nd organized, they all get all the Nisi soldiers from Hawaii. They went to Camp Akoi as the 100 battalion. Toshio continues, and then 1943, when they asked for volunteers for the 442nd, me and my younger brother, Shinichi, yeah, we volunteered at the same time. Toshio continues, then the other brother of mine, the last one, he was MIS, almost at the end of the war. Yeah, that's the seventh boy in the family. So in other words, my, fa my father had four sons to the army service and all survived. I got wounded, the hundred boy, Eiichi got wounded, the one Shinichi got wounded, but we all survived. Well, you know, there's four brothers all giving service to their country at one time. Uh, another excerpt from Nancy, about a close call in the war. This is about Hill 140. If I'm not mistaken, was July 1945. The shell landed, artillery shell landed within my foxhole in the platoon guides foxhole. The shell landed, our section, our machine gun section was on that flank already. One, two, three, or four GIs were buried underneath the stack in the foxhole because of the explosion. Toshio continues, and in my foxhole, we enlarged the foxhole. The platoon sergeant was sitting. First platoon sergeant was in my foxhole. He get the eardrum, he get his eardrum bust in the same explosion. He asked me, what happened? I tell, no, no, I cannot hear. My ear, something trouble my ear. I cannot hear. Then I twist him around. I told him, go back home. Go home back, I say. You take this direction and you go straight ahead and don't come back anymore. He didn't come back. Toshio continues, at that time, I thought I was going to die already, uh, really. First time that. And that previous to the shellings. We we're getting shelled. So much shelling. Hey, I'm not really a person that really goes to church Sundays and you know, but I believe in religion, but it made me pray in the foxhole boy and prayer was that much serious and the shelling was going on. Altogether, Toshio and his siblings were a total of 11 children. Today, I have two of his surviving sisters who are here to accept the bound oral history transcript for their brother, Toshio Nancy Endo. Caroline Endo Oishi and her son, Craig Oishi, as well as Evelyn Endo Oyoka are here to represent the Endo family, honoring Toshio Nancy Endo and brothers Eiichi Endo, Shinichi Endo, and Michikata Endo. Okay, thank you very much. 
much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Unfortunately, we were not able to have a representative of the family of Kiyoshi Kishimoto to be present to accept his trans transcript. Kiyoshi Kishimoto was a veteran of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, Company L. Let me read from your, his transcript. Kiyoshi's interview took us towards the end of the war where Kishimoto and Company L fought a major battle securing a major, a major strate strategic position that sent the Germans on the run. This was the battle of Monfogrito. Yeah, as I said, the, G G the Germans were controlling that hill for I don't know how, how many months, maybe six months, I think. The Americans just could not advance because the Germans were controlling the hill. The hill controlled the whole Italian coastline from front and back. Front, they could pinpoint all of the troops whenever they made movement. And then far and as far as the Germans were concerned, they were up at the top. They could control the whole Italian coast all the way up to Genoa. So once you get to get the hill, you're controlling the Italian coastline already. And our objective, objective was to get that hill. And I guess that was a brilliant strategy somebody had. But to go from the back, to go up the hill, the Mount Fogarito is 3,000 feet. Kiyoshi continues, thing was it was steep and you had to grab to, uh, to bushes and some small trees that were growing. Just pull yourself up, he continues. But just before dawn, we reached the top and I guess the Germans were still sleeping. Then we didn't get any fire. By the time we got to the top of the hill, we caught the Germans real. We caught, caught them napping, I guess you call them. This wasn't the end of the battle, but the surprise attack helped the Americans to break through the Goth, uh, the Germans uh, defenses. We thank the family for supporting the Maui sons and daughters of the Nisa veterans in our oral history program. I'd like to just close with um, short thank yous. I would like to close for giving special mahalo to several individuals who have worked on the oral history project for over 25 years. Don Dudsing was our past historian and interviewer for most of our oral history interviews. Roy Tanaka, he moved to the mainland but continued to complete transcriptions and oversight of our project. Kawa Watanabe, who you saw a little of tonight, is a local volunteer working with uh, Roy in completing the project. Numerous volunteers, interviewers, transcribers, and reviewers also. Sorry of them if I missed anyone. With over 25 years, I am sure that there are many more who contributed. Thanks to the families who came out tonight. Thanks to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center for giving us this time in the program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leonard. Thank you so much, Maui sons and daughters of the Nisei Veterans for um, allowing us to be a part of your very special presentation. Um, at this time, we are going to take a short break to hear from two more of tonight's sponsors. And when we come back, we will have another trivia question and the presentation of our Hero Award. So see you back here in about a minute. <laughs> We're your local grocer that grew up right along with you. Our managers are from Maui, based on the same foods you know and love. That's why you'll always find a wide variety of local and ethnic brands for family recipes, as well as fresh produce, select quality meats, and an entire aisle for gatherings. Cooking family meals is affordable with Maui's locally owned grocer. Who is How Smart? How Smart is a locally owned company that's been around for over 64 years, serving all of Hawaii's communities. You probably know us better as Hawaii's favorite craft store, Ben Franklin Crafts. Or as the Ace Hardware Stores on Kauai, Maui, and Hawaii Island. We've been helping generations of Hawaii's families get what they need for their craft and DIY projects. And we plan on helping you for generations to come. So, mahalo Hawaii for supporting our family of How Smart stores. Welcome back. Now, Kathy Collins was lightning fast in answering our first trivia question. So remember my tip, keys on the, fingers on the keyboard. I'm gonna help you out. 
Kathy Collins, phone call on line two. Please pick up phone call on line two. Our next trivia question is this. Construction is currently underway to enclose the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center Pavilion and turn it into a resource center. The pavilion was named in honor of one of our Maui Nisei veterans who served in the 100th Infantry Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team. The Resource Center will continue to carry his name. Who was the pavilion named after? I feel like this is a pretty easy question. If anybody has been paying attention to um, maybe what Jill was talking about, so uh, we will allow you some time to type in your answer there in the little question and answer box at the bottom left of your screen. And while you are doing that, we will move ahead with our, oh, there it is. Francine Lee, you are correct. The correct answer is Stanley Izumigawa. So thank you, Francine. Thanks for participating. And you too have a wonderful Nisei Veterans Memorial Center swag bag with lots of goodies coming to you. Um, at this time, it is very exciting to um, go to our next thing, which is the presentation of our Hero Award, the reason, one of the reasons we are here this evening. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome one of our newest board members to talk a little bit more about the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center Hero Award, Miss Jan Yokouchi. So please help me welcome Jan Yokouchi to tell us a little bit more. Welcome, Jan. Thanks, Deja. At a luncheon in 1952, Club 100 Veterans adopted for continuing service as their slogan. Having served their nation in war, the veterans sought to continue the tradition of service to their communities, state, and country. On every island, veterans engaged their communities making the islands a better place for all. On Maui, for continuing service, was one of the inspirations for building the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center as a living memorial to provide service to the, com for, oh, sorry, to provide service to the community in perpetuity. The Nisei Veterans Memorial Center Hero Awards were created to help recognize the positive impact of Maui's best and to recognize those current day heroes who continue to serve their community. Tonight, we recognize a family-owned business whose owner <clears throat> was instrumental in envisioning and moving forward with the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center campus. Sponsored by Housemart, please help me welcome board member Trevor Tokishi to present this award. Thank you, Jan. What is a legacy? A legacy means putting your stamp on the future. It means making a contribution to future generations. A legacy means not just life, it means living. It means learning from the past, living from the present, and building for the future. Legacy is something the Kawasaki family knows a lot about. The partnership between Maui Chemical, TJ Warehouse, and the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center started in 1985 when Miles Kawasaki was the chairperson of the historical committee for the Maui and Sons and Maui sons and daughters of the 442nd. It was because of his leadership, individuals got together and eventually adopted a resolution that read, and I quote, be it resolved that the Maui sons and daughters of the 442nd recognize and accept as our obligation, the duty to preserve, to perpetuate and to cherish the ideals the culture and the heritage of our fathers. Inherent in this obligation is the need to establish and maintain a permanent structure which would embody the efforts of our fathers and also serve as a vehicle to carry forth those values we seek to preserve. To this end, we dedicate our efforts to the establishment and perpetuation of a facility congruent to those needs." End quote. Bra, chicken skin. If you never get chicken skin right there, that's my fault for not reading right. You know, go look it up. It's worth it. It's 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 incredible. But from that day, August seventh, nineteen eighty five, till this day, you know, the Kawasaki family and their business has stood side by side, not just the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, but our whole community, 
generously giving back and perpetuating all that is good about our island home. So with that, please help me to welcome this year's Nisei Veterans Memorial Center Hero Award recipient, TJ Warehouse, represented by Todd Kawasaki. Congratulations, Todd. Thank you, Chair. Good evening and aloha everyone. Um, thank you so much for this award tonight. Uh, it is truly an honor to be this year's Heroes Award recipient. Um, and on behalf of the Kawasaki family, on behalf of TJ's Warehouse, we just like to be, uh, we just like to uh, say that we're truly grateful for the recognition tonight. Um, and I would just also like to say that because of the Nisei veterans, because of their bravery, their sacrifice, their willingness to put themselves in harm's way uh, to prove their loyalty to their country is why I'm able to stand here today, a proud American of Japanese ancestry. Uh, we greatly value the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, Memorial Center and we uh, truly believe in their mission of carrying forward the legacy of the Nisei Veterans. Um, I look forward to watching the center prosper and uh, you know, if you can make it through a uh, global pandemic, I feel like you can make it through just about anything. So thank you again for this wonderful award. We are truly grateful for um, the partnership and thank you. Thank you very much and congratulations, Todd. Um, mahalo for all that you do, all that your family does. Um, for our community. We greatly appreciate it. And we also wanna thank you for the delicious um, bento items that you prepared this evening and last year as well. So thank you very much. Um, we will take a short break to hear from some of our sponsors and we will be right back with our keynote speaker, Mr. Lane Nishikawa. The perfect floor starts at your locally owned Abbey Carpet and Floor Showroom. Personalized service, expert assistance, incredible selection, free estimates, professional installation. We'll pamper your home from start to finish. We know our neighbors because we are your neighbor. Locally owned Abbey Carpet of Maui has been serving the Maui community for over 25 years. At Napa, we keep things moving. If it has wheels and an engine, we help keep it on the road. And if it's on the road, we have parts for it. And if you need a part, you can get it fast. At Napa, when we're not thinking about cars, we're thinking about the people who drive them. Because when it comes to serving you and our community, our motor never quits. All right, uh, again, we wanna thank all of our sponsors who were part of this evening. Um, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Mr. Lane Nishikawa. Lane Nishikawa has been in the film, television and theatrical industries for over 35 years. His dramatic feature film, Only the Brave, appeared in over 18 film festivals, broadcast on national television and to over 15 countries worldwide. He was artistic director of the Asian American Theater Company in San Francisco before forming Mission from Buddha Productions, a theme, the, uh, film theater production company. His new company, West River Productions, just completed production of The Lost Years, a comprehensive examination of the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. He is in development of a new documentary, The League of Dreams, the story of the 90 plus year history of the Japanese American Citizens League, the oldest and largest Asian American civil rights organization in the US. 
He has been published in numerous periodicals, and most recently, his first novel, Give Me Strength, Ikiru Yuki, has been published. He has received numerous awards, including ABC Television, the National Endowment of the Arts, the National Japanese American Citizens League, the Harvard Foundation, the White House Millennium Council, the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund, the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program, and most recently, the National Park Service Japanese American Confinement Sites Program. Lane currently sits on the advisory board of the San Diego JACL and served on the advisory boards of the Pacific Arts Movement and the National Gopher Broke National Education Foundation. Lane has taught at Stanford University, San Francisco State University, and CSU Monterey Bay, and the University of Hawaii Maui College. Um, and even though he is so very, very busy, he has uh, given us some of his time tonight. So please help me give a very warm virtual Maui welcome to Mr. Lane Nishikawa. Lane, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Deidre. And I want to thank the Nisei Veterans uh, Memorial Center for inviting me to speak tonight at your annual dinner. Very honored. I want to thank Todd of Hawaiian Video Memories for assisting with all the technical aspects. And you know, I got to say these past two years have been very challenging, but it's great uh, to be here with you tonight. You know, back in March of 2020, Deidre and I were talking about bringing my then new film, Our Lost Years to Maui. I was really looking forward to it. And then the COVID pandemic started to increase and spread. So our plans along with about 20 other cities were put on hold or postponed. Now, 20 months later, I'm getting calls from all over to have live events and theaters next spring, and I can't wait. But first, we're gonna roll a clip of some of my films, and then I'll be right back to talk with you in a few minutes. So Todd, whenever you're ready, you can roll it. And when the Maui leaving? Two weeks? You territorial guard guys get all the fun, eh? <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. A name like Grace, you're not very graceful. <laughs> All my cousins are in the hundred. I enlisted today. How can you make this decision without talking to me? I watch these men grow up. I've taken care of their families. Or your family. What is it? It's a belly band. All the women in camp each put a stitch in. So the spirit of a thousand loved ones will be with you. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go! Watch the life of a man slowly go dark many times, knowing death was coming, and all they could think about was their loved ones. A last chance to see life. Jimmy, you listen to Papa now. You must accept your fate here. The rest of you will follow from here. The Texas 141st is in trouble. They need our help. We got the nod. Let's move! Open it to me, Jimmy. Sergeant Takata, I just want to thank you. Whether you're from Hawaii or Mississippi, we're all here for the same reason. We're going to go home together or die together. widespread and the deadliest war in history. Every year, America buries more and more of our brave veterans who fought for our freedoms. This year, 
the San Diego Japanese American Citizens League is honoring their few remaining soldiers of the 100th 442nd Regimental Combat Team and the Military Intelligence Service and their families with a documentary film. My father and all his fellow soldiers established, you know, a basic freedom for all of us. They fought for Hawaii to remember Pearl Harbor. They fought to prove their loyalty to the country that locked away their families in the 10 desert camps across the U.S. They fought for us. Their courage made the regiment the most decorated unit in U.S. military history. They fought prejudice, uh, they fought against the enemy and they fought prejudice here in America. It is an American story, so it should be told. Why is it important to continue on with a story that happened 70 years ago? How is that relevant? That you are not who you are, but you are the product of your past generations. What they've done, the sacrifices they made for our community, to, to make things better for us. They pl plowed the road for us, the next generation. And to me that that was pretty remarkable because I know being a descendant, it's heartbreaking to me. So I find that that strength is really, really powerful and um, impressive. How would you describe your father? These are guys that went out to prove their loyalty. Uh, they gave their word, they took an oath, they kept it. Uh, honor above all. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of each and every one of them as, as I am my dad. He's, uh, he's my hero. And I think it shaped us knowing how easy we have. Anything that we do, it's just easy. He had a heart. What were you thinking when he's talking about his father, your grandfather? Um, that he had a really strong bond, I guess, with his mother. Anything else you want to say about him? He must have been a great father, too. Help us preserve their legacy for our children, our grandchildren, and our future generations. What does this mean to you? It gives me a lot of comfort to be able to, you know, stop in periodically and uh, talk to my dad because um, I really miss him. <laughs> Contact the San Diego JCL now. Honor them. Join our fight to never forget. We never will forget what you have done. What did you lose in 1942? A farm? Your business? Your home? Did you lose your youth? Did you lose your dignity? Did you lose your pride? Did you fight in the war? Did you watch your friends die? If you had a Japanese face, your lives would forever change because of our race. this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. People were just staring at us. A fate which will live in infamy. You felt at the pit of your stomachs that something was going to be terribly wrong. After Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the FBI came in and were making all these sweeps and stuff, and a lot of my father's friends were taken away. They picked him up very, very quickly. I mean, like within three hours. It's very clear that what the U.S. did um, with 9066 was truly 
an injustice at a strike of a pen. We could only take what we could carry. It was just chaotic. What do you do with a household of, of furniture? And how do you decide what you're going to take with you? And if you had a mortgage, you can't make the mortgage payment. You're going to get your, your property repossessed. You're going to get your car taken away. I became, as a child, sort of ashamed of being Japanese. They lived in a stable. I think she found that to be embarrassing and appalling. They were then transported across the country. They ended up in Roar, Arkansas. It was a swamp land. The guards up in those towers really were a symbol of fear for me. We had a lot of doubts about the validity of this mass exclusion without any due process rights. If this country could take us Japanese Americans and have us forcibly be removed, take away all of our goods. Don't take away my constitutional rights and then throw a few dollars at me and say everything's cool. How the heck do you expect this country to apologize for that? And, and how are we going to get any kind of compensation? The reason it's never been tried before is because it's impossible. You cannot win this fight. And besides, you can't sue the government. Gee, that's just really bad. And the Nisei would look at the San Jose and say, can we really win this redress? Can we really get an apology? Just the numbers would have told you we shouldn't do this. This is suicide. And of course, the answer at that time was, we don't know, but we have to try. The average age of Nisi was, was 18. And then, you know, like on one hand, it's the structure within the family, you know, is, is the old man is still the boss. You know, you're still the son, but you're 18, but, but the government's looking to you. You're the one who's English proficient. You know, uh, you're the one who's a citizen. And all of a sudden, like, you know, you're the shot caller. I can't even imagine what it would have been like back in the, the 40s to have to deal with to, to deal with people with power and authority when your life as a Japanese American was already diminished because you were Japanese, because you were not white. And it's vulnerable to both abuse, it's vulnerable to inexperience, it's vulnerable to all kinds of stuff that are, you know, that play against it. You know, I, I, at 18 years old, I don't, I really don't, wouldn't want very much responsibility because I can't handle it. I don't know, faced with that decision where the government says, we are going to do this, what I would have done. I think it's easy now to say, you know, screw you, I, will, I won't go. But you're stuck in that position. And, and the responsibility is for making decisions that are pretty close to life and death, or at least, you know, feel like it. But when you're the ones who are the target, and nobody is there. I mean, literally, no one comes to your, your aid or even voices the opinion that this is wrong. We cannot do this as a nation. Yeah, because while the camps, you know, we're not death camps like, you know, like, like in Germany, you know, a whole lot of people did believe that they were going to be executed. When you're out there by yourself, I don't know how, personally, I don't know how I would have responded. And so the fear and the anxiety is there. And if you feel the responsibility to make those kind of calls and decisions on behalf of a community. And so, you know, I look at like these young guys who were in the J. So I think they have to have been kind of nuts to do this or very, very committed to what this was all about. People are being moved out of their homes. They're losing everything. You know, you don't know if you're going to live or die. And you're 18 years old. I, I can't imagine it. You know, all I know is my family went to camp. We were at Manzanar for three years. That was our fate. So um, <clears throat> those are some of the films I've done and had so much support. Um, but I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about tonight, you know, Veterans Day being just two days ago. You know, I, th I thought about how this year is the... 76th anniversary of the end of World War II. I thought about the Nisei soldiers and how they have always had a special place in my heart. I thought about my dad and my seven uncles who served with the 100th Battalion, different companies of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the 522nd Artillery Unit, and the MIS. 
I thought about how none of them ever talked about the war. I thought about how they were all so humble about what they went through, like all the veterans I've ever met, and I've met a lot of them, but how honorably they carried themselves and how I felt like I was always in the presence of true courage. I thought about how it's hard not to associate the Nisei soldier's story without talking about the internment camps. I thought about my Stockton relatives, my aunties and uncles who were interned at the Roar War Relocation Center in Arkansas and how they never talked about the camps. I thought about how our generation, the Sansei, we grew up without knowing what had happened during the war. I thought about how in some way our parents and our grandparents were protecting us from all the anti-Asian hate, the name calling, the violence, and then the horror of Pearl Harbor. I thought about the disbelief people must have felt after the signing of Executive Order 9066, then reading the placards nailed to the telephone poles instructing families to prepare for departure at the nearest train station. I thought about the agony of selling homes, businesses, farms, all your worldly possessions and carrying with you what you could save, unaware of what the future held. I thought about the misery, hardship and desolation associated with this new view of the world inside the barbed wire fences and armed guard towers, the wooden and tar paper barracks that offered no privacy the humiliation of the public toilets and showers and the long lines at the mess halls. I thought about my father telling me how he saw the Japanese Zero strafing the airfield at Schofield Barracks early one Sunday morning on their way to Pearl Harbor and how he and his brother jumped in a truck with some of their friends and headed to town to see how they could help. I thought about my dad's cousin who was in the Territorial Guard and was the first to ship out with the 100th Battalion in May of 1942, ironically, on a ship called the SS Maui. I thought about how my other uncles joined the 10,000 young Japanese American men who volunteered in Honolulu when word got out that the army was forming a full regiment. I thought about how difficult it must have been to volunteer out of the camps after the government took away all of your rights. I thought about how the decision to leave your family behind and how that decision was for their loved ones and for any future you might have as an American. I thought about my dad, how he couldn't wait until he turned 18 so he could enlist and join his brother who was already fighting in Europe. I thought about all the stories the veterans shared with me, all the books I read, and I thought about all the Nisei veteran conventions I attended in Honolulu and Las Vegas. I thought about meeting the guys that Sadao Munamori say, jumping on that grenade and how they told me there isn't a day that goes by that they don't think of him and what he did. I thought about all their battles, Naples, Sol Salerno, Volturno, Rome, Casino, Belvedere, Anzio, Briers, Belmont, Bifontaine, Pisa, the Lost Battalion, and Dachau. I thought about how my aunt told me one night how my dad's brother, my uncle Blackie, would wake up screaming, still fighting the ghosts. I thought about how a few Nisei veterans told me they remembered him, about how they would take a town and they would look for the biggest restaurant and bar to set up headquarters. And if there was a piano, how my uncle Blackie would be playing all night as they drank. I thought about how one night, Years after my uncle Fred passed away, my aunt gave me his medals and his sending body, his belly band, and what the thousand red stitches meant. I thought about sitting in a circle of Nisei veterans and how they were mesmerized by every word Colonel Young Oak Kim said as he described the battlefield. I thought about how one veteran told me that if you were caught without your helmet on, you were fined $50 and how $50 was a lot of money in those days. So everyone wore their helmets. 
I thought about the descriptions of the intense mortar fire hitting the trees and hot shrapnel and sharp wood chunks would rain down on you. I thought about the rescue of the lost battalion, four days of fighting, hundreds of casualties, and Barney Hajiro leading the charge, knocking out three machine gun nests and getting shot so many times he couldn't advance, but they broke through the enemy lines to victory. I thought about how the Texans would invite the Nisei veterans to Texas for a reunion and how Governor John Connolly made the entire regiment honorary Texans. I thought about how my dad's good friend, Lieutenant Nakamura, who was promoted because all the Caucasian officers were killed and how he was with the 522nd Artillery Unit when they were sent to join the 4th Division as the Allied forces pushed into Germany, about how their Ford scout reported there was a prison camp ahead, about how he jumped in a jeep with the scout and went to see for himself, and about how when he got to the prison, he couldn't believe what he saw. Prisoners, almost skeletons, just skin and bones, and he ordered the scout to shoot the lock off the gate, and how they shuffled out, weak and starving, about how this was Coffering Four, one of the 30 satellite slave labor camps of Dachau. I thought about how the Nisei veterans in K Company talked about Doc, who was in his 40s, about how he volunteered out of Manzanar, about how as men got shot, they would yell medic and Doc was right there in the heat of battle doing his best to save a life. I thought about how the Nisei veterans told me the German snipers would target the men with that red medic cross on their helmets but it didn't stop Doc until he died running to help a wounded soldier. I thought about how one of the Nisei veterans told me the average age of the 142nd Regiment was 25. I thought about how one of the Nisei veterans told me that Gopher Broke was only half of the model. I asked him what was the other half? He said, Gopher Broke, no matter make. Give it your all, no matter we die. I thought about how all of these stories, all those moments the veterans shared with me would end up in a script one day. And that script was only the brave. You know, I, I didn't know when I first started in this crazy business of theater and film, but I did have this one creative writing teacher in college who told me your best writing will come from what you know and what is important to you. So from that very first play I wrote, I decided to tell their stories. Their stories needed to be shared with audiences. Their story of being the most decorated unit in American military history was a story that America knew nothing about. And I would be their voice. But you know, you know only the brave, it, it didn't happen overnight. You know, by then I had had already 20 years of theater under my belt, over 60 productions, touring to over 50 cities. And I did two short films first before I felt I was ready. Only the Brave was probably the most effortless script I ever wrote. And I know it was because of all the research I had done, but also all the discussions I had after shows and how all the veterans and their families would share a moment or two with me. And it just came together at the right time. And I had a lot of help. The National Japanese American Historical Society was my fiscal sponsor. and We got a grant from the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program. We knew we had a long way to go to reach our budget. So we launched a national fundraising drive and we got halfway there. Donations came in from all around the country, mainly from veterans and their families. Then we set out and found a group of investors and almost every one of them had a relative who was a veteran. And we got to the three quarter mark. And then something amazing happened. My producer met with her contact at Universal Studi Studios and they had a program to help independent films. And we got one of the slots. They picked three films a year, and only The Brave was one of them. They didn't give you money, but they gave you access to the back lot. Normally, production companies have to pay $25,000 a day to be back there. And for us, it was no charge. 
just equipment and personnel. We shot only the Brave in 21 days, three six day weeks and three pickup days. Nobody in LA believes me, but we were, uh, but you know, we were on a tight budget, so we had a tight schedule. 10 of our days were at Universal. So we saved $250,000. We had an amazing 85 man woman crew, 32 speaking roles, 27 of them Asian Americans. And I don't know when was the last time you saw an American made film that had 27 Asians speaking, but we did. We had a hundred extras on our biggest day. It was during the charge to reach the Texans. Our costumer was from Windtalker and our armorer was from We Were Soldiers. I needed great people around me to make sure that we told the Nisei soldier story of the rescue of the lost battalion, right. And I gotta say, aside from our sold out film screening at the EL Theater, one of the coolest moments was when we showed it at the Hawaii Theater in Honolulu. 1,400 seats filled to capacity. 300 Nisei veterans and their families, current soldiers of the 442, and the welcome delivered by Senator Akaka. Senator Noah was out of town, but it was still very cool. I gotta tell you, um, I was born in Hawaii. I'm from Waiwa. My folks moved us to the mainland, uh, San Francisco, when I was just a little kid. But I remember getting on the Pan Am jet when I was four, coming back home, staying at my Obachan's house, spending time with all the aunties and uncles and cousins. Three months out of the year, my sister and I were in Camp Hawaii. And my folks who, my folks who both worked would fly in at the end of August to take their vacation and uh, bring us back. And so it was kind of a schizo upbringing. On one hand, in Hawaii, you're part of the majority. Asians are everywhere. The grocery store, the gas station, everyone who worked in every restaurant, all the commercials on TV, every cop is Asian. Then you go back to the mainland, and I'm one of three kids in my elementary school class. I had Michael Lou on my left, and I had Nancy Missouri on my right. So as you grow up, you put up with all the name calling, all the chink jab gook jokes, and you get into a lot of fights, and you're constantly in the principal's office. So your mom has to take off work to come and get you. One time on my way home, my mom said, so a boy hit you? And I said, yeah, and he called me a Jap. And she said, did you hit him? I said, yeah. So then she says, if a boy hits you, make sure you hit him twice. That was my mom. Five foot tall, tough as nails. That's where I get half of the Hawaiian in me. My dad, on the other hand, you know, he handled discipline differently. When I was about six, and that's when most boys start getting rowdy, my dad would just drop me off at judo class in Japantown. I think my dad just wanted to hang out with his golfing buddies and have a beer. And then when you're about 13 and you're getting more ornery, Japanese discipline is called the karate dojo. But I owe it to my dad, sending us back home to Hawaii every year. I think it gave me the strength to survive being a minority on the mainland. And it's probably why when I started writing, it was always about speaking up, standing up for who you are, wanting to understand what being Asian American meant, not accepting all the racism and prejudice, educating audiences, combating ignorance, eliminating fears. And since the first monologue I wrote until this day, I haven't stopped. You know, I spent eight incredible years coming back and forth to Maui, working with the Maui Arts and Culture Center, Maui Community College, the Iao Theater, and the Maui County Correctional Center. You know, whether it was one of my touring plays or showing one of my films, 
the audiences here, well, there, have been terrific. I have great memories of the Maui sons and daughters of the Nisei veterans always being so supportive. I have great memories of playing golf with Pundi Yokouchi and his Sunday bunch group. I have great memories of all the noodles at Sam Sato's, best on Maui. One of my greatest memories was when I was able to write a play called When We Were One. But the problem was I had to try and cast it. I know the Mac didn't have the budget to fly in and house actors from Honolulu. So I taught an acting class at Maui Community College and looked for people who were comfortable getting in front of people and speaking. So I thought about lawyers, politicians, local radio and television personalities, and I asked around. I was told to go to a bar in Lower Maine on Tuesday night. Sure enough, I met Richard Minatoya, Dennis Nakamura, and Dane Kane, and I convinced them to come in and read for me. Long story short, they along with Kathy Collins, Jamar Solomon, local actors Denise Fleetham, Derek Nakagawa, Rochelle Ashana, one of my students, Terry Sasaki, and my good, good buddy, Brian Connolly, joined the cast. We had such a great time putting on that show. Mayor Victorino mentioned that I'm in San Diego now. Uh, you know, my folks moved here in the late 70s, so my dad was offered a position with Kilsara. He was a financial officer. So you can imagine when I was growing up trying to make it as an actor, writer, or director in theater and film, he'd say to me, when are you going to get a real job? Maybe you should go into real estate. Everybody buys homes. I probably should have listened to it. But you know what? It was during my last stint on Maui in 2004. I had just shot Only the Brave. And my editor was working on the film in L.A. So I had some time and I was working with the inmates at MCCC and they were going to perform at the Mac. But then I got a call that my dad had a heart attack and I immediately flew to San Diego. Well, you know, he stabilized and my cousin flew in to take care of my mom while he was in rehab. I flew back to Maui and finished the show and repacked my stuff from Oakland and drove right down to San Diego. I took care of him when he got out of the hospital, and then my sister and I found out that my mother had Alzheimer's. That was a game changer. Three months later, though, he had another heart attack and passed away. I then moved everything down to San Diego to care, take care of my mom, and I never left. But one cool moment during all of this, you know, my editor had finished the rough cut of Only the Brave, and I would drive up to LA and get the tapes and drive back. And I'd sit in the living room, viewing the rough cut and take notes for changes. My dad was pretty weak, but he would sit in the living room with me and watch me work. He'd look at me after one of the battle scenes and say, where the hell did you learn to do this? This is amazing. And you know, I just laugh. He never was able to see the final cut on the big screen. But those moments in the living room, they were precious. Anyway, I was uh, going to talk about how I ended up doing my documentary, Never Forget, in San Diego with the veterans. But I think we might be running out of time. Um, so I wanted to uh, tell you about a new documentary I just got funding for. It's called AAPI United. And it's going to be about stop AAPI hate, the campaigns that are going on around the country. It's funded by Kaiser Permanente, and it's getting pretty, pretty exciting as we get closer to shooting. And I really think it's important for what's going on today with all the anti-hate and violence happening across the country. You know, all of the go back to where you came from, the spitting, spitting on your face, graffiti painted on businesses, beating, stabbing, shootings, murder, all this is nothing new to us. The anti-Asian sentiment has been here ever since our grandparents and great-grandparents stepped off the boat. And it escalated after every war. After World War I, during the Great Depression, 
yellow peril was taking all the jobs. There were just too many of us. They had to stop immigration. We became the enemy, the scapegoat of the stock market, and it came crashing down on us. Then World War II, Korean War, the Vietnam War. Then we became the gooks of the world, the VC, Charlie. In the 80s and 90s, the economic war with Japan brought a whole new meaning to the anti-Asian hate and violence. The beating death of Vincent Chin shocked us. You could now kill an Asian and the fine was $3,000. And now it's a COVID war. And the latest statistics has over 9,000 reported incidents. So I thought, you know, I'd end with a piece I wrote years ago. I feel the fight hasn't changed and we just got to pick ourselves up again. But I do feel a renewed strength. Give me one second. So I wrote this piece for one of my one-man shows that I toured around the country. This piece is called Home of the Brave. America was all I knew. Even when I took that pilgrimage back to the motherland, even when I took a chance to remember who I am, even when I replanted my roots and said, yes, I can, even when I raised a fist for civil rights to take a stand, even when I took an oath to change our troubled land, America was all I knew. And I am all generations of the waves of immigration. I'm not an Asian invasion. I'm the voice of our nation. I'm an Angel Island examination. I needed a welcome, not deportation, because all I wanted was a once in a lifetime chance to come to these shores and do the Liberty Dance because America was all I knew. And I'm all generations who suffered and toiled, who built the valleys and railroads, who gave life to barren soil, who watched the stock market crash, who drank through prohibition, who stood in line for bread, who believed in the constitution, who put a man on the moon, who shuddered at the Klan, who bought bonds for peace, who said yes to Uncle Sam, because America was all I knew. America was all I knew ever since Sergeant Fury's howling commandos cut down yellow hordes in a comic book. Ever since James Shigeta got the girl in the end, the crimson kimono got a dirty look. Ever since Bruce Lee entered the dragon, an Asian man grabbed the world and shook. Ever since Platoon and Full Metal Jacket turned our image right back into gooks. Ever since the Karate Kids, Mr. Miyagi proved we're all not just cooks. Ever since the Bounty and Brando had a mutiny, a Hawaiian princess was all it took because America was all I knew. America was all I knew as a young boy saluting the red, white, and blue. As a teenage mutant ninja turtle who learned the art of Kung Fu. As a fool who fell in love with Marilyn Monroe and wished she loved me too. As a red-blooded patriot who thought Vietnam could not be true. As a protesting radical because it was what we had to do. As a father of the Yonsei who loves to eat rice with beef stew as a 50 something family man whose glass ceiling is almost due. America was all I knew. And I am the lone wolf who defied the tanks at the massacre at Tiananmen Square. I am the rising sun of Crichton's fantasy. I am Michael Chimino's nightmare. I am the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge. I am the deer hunter's prey. I am the black rain falling on Michael Douglas. I'm tired and wishing for a new day. Because when will they see that I'm not just a killer? I don't just do autopsies and bow. 
I am not an exotic conquered toy of the white man. When will they learn? I'll never kowtow. Because I am Senator Daniel Inouye, who lost an arm fighting in World War II. I'm former secretary, Norm Mineta. I'm Charlie Angel, Lucy Liu. I'm Christy Yamaguchi, crowned the Olympics golden ice queen. I'm I am Pei, the great architect. I'm Lynn Sakata, who played second base for the Royals. Don't you think we deserve a little respect? I'm Tamlin Tamita, little Tokyo's Nisei queen, queen, Daniel Sun's love from Okinawa. I'm Hiroshima, LA's award-winning jazz fusion band. I'm conductors Nagano and Ozawa. I'm Captain James Wong. I fought in Desert Storm. I'm the scape scapegoat of friendly fire. I'm Amy Chow, one of gymnastics' magnificent seven, soaring with my teammates' desire. I'm Hideo Nomo and Chan Ho Park, who pitched for the Dodgers in blue. I'm Dale Manami and Yuri Kochiyama, who fight so Asian American dreams will come true. I'm Tiger Woods. I was a master's champ. I was born half Asian at birth. And I can hit a Titleist golf ball farther than any human being on the face of this planet we call Earth. I'm Gordon Hirabayashi, Fred Korematsu, and Min Yasui. The three of us told the government internment was, was wrong. I was next in line at the Winter Olympics. I am the icebreaker, Michelle Kwan. I am Maya Lin, who created the Vietnam War Memorial. I'm astronaut Ellison Onizuka. I'm Vera Wang, designing fashions for the chic. I'm the River Kwai Seshu Hayakawa. I'm Margaret Cho, the all-American girl, making the comedy club audiences roar. I'm U.S. Marine Lieutenant Bush Yamashita, who was reinstated back in the Corps. I'm ex-Consul General Chiyuni Sugihara, the Schindler of Japan. I am Judge Lance Ito, who presided over the biggest trial in the land. I am all the voices from every aspect of life. I've lasted over 150 years. I'm from a dozen cultures from around the world in America. I'm still here. America was all I knew back when Lincoln fought a war because it was wrong to keep slaves. Back when my grandfather came over because it was the path he had to pave. Back when my folks did the Lindy Hop because Benny Goodman was all the craze. Back when Ed Sullivan gave us the Beatles because television was our crave. Back when the Cold War ended because D-Day made its landing wave after wave. Back when I light incense for my ancestors because they'll be there at my grave. When I'm finally free on this land because it's the home of the brave. America, will you love me too? Thank you uh, for uh, allowing me to do that. Uh, thank you for um, being with us this evening. That was moving and marvelous. And truly, there are not words to describe um, how it has inspired all of us. And we are so glad you didn't go into real estate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad actually was too. <laughs> <laughs> but love the trip down memory lane and um, Lane, we can't wait to have you back here on Maui as soon as it is possible. We uh, look forward to seeing your movie, uh, some more from your one man show. Maybe you can do something upstairs in our Stanley Izumi Gallery uh, Resource Center. Uh, but yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are so appreciative for your time this evening. Mahalo. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, you know, what an amazing evening, Bo. I think you can agree with me. I, I feel very 21st century doing this again via a live Zoom broadcast, but uh, I do look forward to when we are all able to meet again in person. Um, be sure to check out our silent auction. It is online at 32auctions.com slash NVMC. We have no supply shortage here. We everything that we have on the auction is available and ready for bidding and pickup. So please think of our auction when you think of your holiday um, gifts. I think we have time for one more trivia 
question. And um, let's see again, a big mahalo to Melanie for putting these together. The entry hallway of the NVMC Education Center is named in honor of the last commanding officer of the 100th Infantry Battalion. He was also the very last original member of the 100th Infantry Battalion to leave Europe at the end of World War II. Who was he? Uh, we will gently wait for a couple answers to come in, um, but if you don't type in right away, you can type it in as that answer comes to you. Uh, Bo, it has been an amazing opportunity to be here with you this evening, uh, co emceeing and celebrating all of the heroes amongst us. Thank you, Deidre. We, we want to thank Lane Nishikawa, all our sponsors, guests, volunteers, and especially everyone who made this evening possible. And with that, we will close out the evening with a special message from all of us here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center board and staff. Aloha. On behalf of Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, we want to say thank you for your support, for your friendship, for your commitment, and for your dedication to the values and sacrifices of our Nisei soldiers and their families. Thank you for allowing us to share these stories. Okage sama day. We couldn't do it without you. Thank, Thank you. Sandy. 